Welcome back, guys. Today, I have Mariana on with us. And did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, beautifully. Okay. All right. And she is a procrastination and focus coach, but I'm going to turn it over to her to let her introduce herself. Thank you, Mandy. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Mariana Favre Bonet. So I am a procrastination and focus coach. And since 2016, I've been helping people either overcome procrastination or change their habits and mostly bring their creative ideas to life. And after transitioning from my postdoc, I earned my first professional and personal leadership coaching certification. And then I went through several other certifications. And um, now I've successfully guided clients to go from flashing cursor on the screen to an effortless first draft as a procrastination and focus coach. Well, I'm sure that's going to perk the ears of a lot of my audience because I have a whole lot of creatives, you know, working with people with ADHD. And it's my understanding you're one of us, right? You have ADHD as well? Yes. I recently, last year, uh, met the criteria for ADD. Yes. Okay. So you would be considered inattentive. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. And that's the difference for those of you that don't know. When you hear people say ADD, usually that means inattentive. It's um, not in the SM5. Now we all we all fall under ADHD, um, whether you're hyperactive combined or inattentive. But when you hear ADD used, it's usually inattentive. So you know, you know what type of brain you're you're talking to. But we before this recording were talking, and I was really interested in something that you said about there being different types of procrastination. And you said you got it from the book, Succeeding with Adult ADHD, which I have not read. I thought I read them all. So I'm super excited to jump into that after my meetings today. But can you tell us about the different types of procrastination? Absolutely. I love how uh, Dr. Abigail Livrini, I hope I'm not butchering her name. I probably am. <laughs> she talks about this four different types, which is forgetful, distracted, big picture, and perfectionistic. So forgetful for a lot of us, this is very much, um, this is very common, especially for people with poor working memory, but it's typically when you go like, wait, what task? Or wait, what do I need to do? That's the forgetful type. The distracted type, are usually the people who have a difficult time managing their desires to check their phone or to get up um, from your desk and getting something more fun to do. Uh, the big picture people, which is me, it's the people who have difficulty breaking down the steps to achieve a bigger goal. So for example, I want to lose 10 pounds or I want to run a marathon, but they get easily overwhelmed with the amount or, or the big picture of 10K instead of, no, today I need to run 500 meters in two minutes or so in order for me to build to that ability. And the perfectionistic type is um, the perfectionistic type is those people who have a high standard to achieve a goal, have a fear of failure. And it typically sounds like if I had more time, I can do this very, very well. So then I might as well not even get started. So those are the types that I, I, hope, I hope that you can see yourself in one or multiple of them because sometimes you might be the forgetful time for one of your goals, but sometimes you might be on the big picture for one of your goals. So then yeah. those um, frame of mind or those perspectives might be um, symptomatic of your type of ADHD. Yeah. And I can see falling into all four of those categories in different ways. But um, 
on the 12 week year challenge, I'm in round two of offering the 12 week year challenge. And what I did is I just opened it up for those that are familiar with the 12 week year. I opened it up to have basically anybody that wanted to join me, join me for weekly accountability meetings. Mm -hmm. And what I tell them is like, you have to have the breakdown of your goals in your face. You cannot put it away somewhere. It can't be just locked in your phone, like put it, put it somewhere digitally, but also put it somewhere where it's very much in your face so that you can't forget. And I, I see with that mm -hmm. goal, I can fall into like the forgetful category often. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so let's jump into focus. Um, tell me, tell me how you talk about focus with your clients. Yeah. So focus, the way that I see focus, Mandy, and everyone listening is might be a little bit different than how you might conceptualize it. I see focus as a behavior versus something that simply happens to us. And so the way that I like talking about focus is focus is a behavior which might different differ from other ways that people see focus as if it's something that simply happens, right? So when I when I'm teaching about focus, I teach a I teach them this three main things that has to happen in order for us to focus effectively. The first one is a decision. We have to decide what matters most in this moment and what doesn't matter for this particular moment. So for example, if I am working towards creating five pieces of content for Instagram and LinkedIn, for example, because I cross-pollinate them, so in this next hour or two hours block, that is my end goal for this two hours. So my first decision has to be what matters most in order for me to get that thing done. That's the decision. The second part of it is going to be managing urges. So urges for me to just go on Instagram and endlessly research, <laughs> quotes, right? Research what others are saying or how others are doing and what would be best for me. So I, I have to make a decision if I am, if I have all of those, the information that I need right now in order for me to accomplish that that those five pieces of content and then manage the urges to do anything else. And I'm not saying go to the bathroom, right? Like those urges, I think we have to most likely honor, right? <laughs> like yeah. this is not an urge to distract, but it's a bi normal biological urge. And managing distractions. For me, I have to have my earbuds in and I have to have an environment where it's quiet enough for my brain to to have like a one line of thinking. And even still, my brain will go back and forth. It's just like meditation, right? Like I decided to sit in meditation, my brain will go and distract. But then my goal is to be able to bring it back gently, right? Like we don't have to use willpower. Notice that it's going and then we bring it back. Mm -hmm. And then once we have those three, three things in place, we're able to create focus. So focus becomes a behavior that you can train when you have the tools to allow for that. Okay. Yeah. You, you were mentioning urges there and it made me think I've, I've worked with so many clients about this where we, you know, we set specific times for things to happen and they get frustrated because they, you know, want to go and do something else. One thing I think of is, um, I, I have an app that I use now that has been helping me so much with my workouts, but as a person, a hyperactive person with ADHD, when I'm weight training, for example, I get really bored. And I want to do anything else besides work out and I own the gym. So my office is just right there steps away. I can just disappear into my office and mm -hmm. do some paperwork or, you know, do something else. 
But one thing that was really helpful that I think goes along with what you're saying is, and I, I share this with my clients, which is reminding myself, you know, making the decision, number one, that this is what I'm mm -hmm. doing. I'm working out right now and remind myself that there is nothing else I need to be doing right now when I have mm. that urge to go away from, from the workout. Right. Yes. Oh my gosh. That's so beautiful, Mindy. And I'm glad that you brought this up because it's very common for people to have conflicting priorities, right? And when we make a decision, oh, this is the only thing that I need to do right now, you allow your brain to still want to do the other thing, whatever it is, which is also important. But then you start gently teaching it that, oh, right now, this is the time to do this. And you also teach yourself to refocus in the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a beautiful example. It has such a calming effect on me. And I yes. hope that that translates with my clients too, where you like just reminding yourself with that thought, there's nothing else yeah. that you're supposed to be doing right now, not in a punishing way, but just in a way yes. where it's like, you are doing exactly what you need to be doing yeah. right now. You're, you're right on yeah. track even though our brain wants to tell us like there are all these other things we could be doing. Yeah. But I love your conversation around urges as far as um, there's a thing called environmental hyperfocus. And I don't, it's a terrible name for it, but what I like to call it is pinballing. It's like you're a ball in a pinball machine and you're mm -hmm. kind of bouncing around to all the different things. And what, mm -hmm. what I tell people that they're, that come to me frustrated that they're doing this, um, and what that might look like is um, for me, it used to be, I'm going to get dressed and then I would go, okay, I don't have the shirt that I want to wear. It's in the laundry room. And so I'm on my way to the laundry room and now I've gone six or seven different places and done 10 different things to, mm -hmm. you know, some capacity, but not to completion. And I'm still not dressed and it's two o'clock and I'm sweaty. You know, that would, <laughs> that would be kind of how my day would, would end up going. And it was so frustrating, but yeah. what I share with people is like, you're simply getting an urge to do something, to pick up the thing that goes into the bathroom and put it there. Um, and you're just answering the urge. And what we need to do mm -hmm. is have the urge, but not answer the urge at that time. And I think that kind of goes really well with the conversation that you're having about, about focus. Absolutely. And this reminds me, Mandy, of like a technique that, that someone can use in this moment. Mm -hmm. Whenever they have that urge, just calling, just naming it as an urge. Oh, yeah. I, I'm having an urge to pick this up, to put it in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Is enough for them to detach a little bit and to um, diffuse a little bit of that urgent feeling that we get that we're training ourselves to respond to. Yeah. So that creates a little bit of softness for you to be like, okay, yeah, this is an urge. I don't have to respond it right now because this is not as important as getting dressed and then moving myself to whatever it is that I, I want to get on time. So then it creates a little bit of space for you to have a different conversation. And I think that having a coach like you that helps them um, create a new line of conversation and practice during the session, it's super important for moments like that so they can retrain their focus and go back to where they want to go back. Yeah. But also, like I, I think it's important that we we identify that as an urge, like that's the first step. And I think that a lot of people can see themselves in that because I I could also see myself. I did that this morning. I was like, oh, I was just cleaning out the kitchen when I wanted to sit here and prepare the the script for to talk to you today. I was like, oh, okay. That's that's what's happening. <laughs> we're going to go back and we're going to sit down and we're going to have fun. Yeah. 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 And creating space, you mentioned. And and that for those of you that are like, yes, I'm that pinball. I am I'm just following every urge. What's happening mm -hmm. there is the urge happens and we automatically follow it. And when you start doing 
you know, when you work with coaches like myself and Mariana, you start to become more aware of your thinking and your feelings and your actions. And that puts basically like a pause or a space between having the urge, which oftentimes is just thinking, I need to go take care of this. And when you have that space, you can recognize, oh, there's the thought. I don't have to answer it immediately. Where some of you that might be new to this work might just think that these urges are just happening to you and you have to follow them. Mm -hmm. Um, but the more we can create that space and create the awareness, I always tell people there's like stages of awareness. First, all your thoughts are just happening to you. And then you stage two is you're aware of them and now you're judging them. And stage three is you're aware of them and you're accepting. Them. And mm -hmm. stage three is where I'm trying to get everybody to be. <laughs> um, and especially when you have ADHD behavior, sometimes you can just get frustrated with yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something I, I thought it was important to talk about is I have a lot of people come to me frustrated at their lack of focus or frustrated that they're trying to focus and, and they're getting distracted. What would you say to people like that? Yeah. And that's a very common emotion for people to have along with shame, right? Because in I like to remind people that whenever we're feeling frustrated, first, that's a very normal response. And second, oftentimes the frustration comes because we're expecting that focus simply being there, just like, oh, I just expect myself to be inspired to, to write something, right? So when we think that focus simply happened, we forget that we have so much more agency on how the focus, how to respond to the quote unquote lack of focus, right? So we forget to put in place the tools, which is the side, manage urges, and prepare for distractions. So you can have that focus or that flow that you're looking for to create whatever it is that you want to create, right? So if you remember, remind yourself that you have agency of how you respond to your brain, even though that might be a stretch at this point, at this moment, and that's okay, but that's a new idea. Mm -hmm. Consider that it's possible that you have a lot of agency of how you're going to respond to how your brain is presenting all the urges and all those thoughts. And when you consider that as a possibility, you have a, a little window for you to, a little window, a little door for you to look into, how might I respond to these urges that I'm having, to this, to this, all of these thoughts that I'm having in a way that allows for focus to be sharpened, right? Mm -hmm. What is in my control to help my brain to focus? That's sometimes a question that I like to give myself, especially like in days like today that I didn't sleep very well. And I have to, and I want to perform in the, on my day in a way that produces in, at the same time that I meet myself where I am. Right. So I prepare for all of those conditions to not be perfect because I that's another tendency that I have, but I can still focus to the best of my ability. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. We, uh, we talked about before the call, we talked about coaching certification and when, um, when I was going through coaching certification, they gave us, they would mail us these big, thick books. And I had Catherine Green as the person that was leading my group. She's a coach, um, fantastic coach, very serene. She's just, <laughs> she's just so amazing to work with, just her calm. Yeah. Um, but I remember bringing to Catherine um, the fact that I felt like I did not absorb information. And especially when I, when I saw those big books, that's immediately what it triggered. It triggered back to college um, when I'd get the big textbooks and I would try to study and then I would go to perform on the test and 
it didn't seem like any of the information sunk in. And so I had all the evidence that this was true. And she helped me understand that it was actually my thought process that was distracting me from focusing on the reading. And what would happen is I would think I'm not going to absorb this information. And I explained to people that it's kind of like a hamster on a wheel and the hamster's running on the wheel. And the information that you're trying to bring in is like sunflower seeds that you're trying to throw into the, for the hamster, but it's like getting thrown out by the wheel. (laughs) And the wheel was my thoughts and like my negative thinking about how this study was going to end up. And she helped me with a thought, which was, she helped me come to this thought, which was, I'm going to get all the information that I need. Mm -hmm. And just that thought, as soon as I would get the practice thought of like, I'm not going to absorb absorb the information and I would lose focus, that thought of I'm going to get everything I need from this helped Mm -hmm. me to calm down It helped stop the chatter. It helped me not be distracted by my thinking and really focus on the information. And I did, I did quite well in coaching certification. And I think it was because of that coaching that really helped me focus. Do you experience things like that with your clients? Definitely. And that's a very common um, theme for clients because either they have the ADHD like symptoms or they were diagnosed uh, with ADHD and that thought is a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Absolutely. So I'm not they going are. to, right? So it's like, and then you have another thought that is a self-fulfilling prophecy, but it actually serves you and helps you drive your focus so much better, right? Because you can find evidences for both. Yeah. And that, which one are you going to focus more of your efforts, right? That will create or derive the results that you want or the the consequences that you want so I think that ultimately it's like effective strategies to help with procrastination often include not only tips and tools to help you manage time but also Use your ability to manage your mindset around your own abilities to remember things and absorb information and um, sharpen your focus or manage your time even, right? Because our thoughts are very, our mindset is very important for us to either build the skills or strengthening the skills that we need or keep them as they are right now. So the way that we're thinking about them matters so much. Absolutely. Whenever people come to me and they're, they're complaining about memory issues, Mm -hmm. the first thing I'm looking to is like, what are you thinking? And how is that thinking stressing you out? And Mm -hmm. with people with ADHD, as soon as our stress levels get high, and if we're making ourselves stressed with our thinking, Mm -hmm. your, your memory is trash after that. (laughs) Um, So that's the first place I look whenever they say I have working memory issues or I don't absorb information. Like I was saying, um, that's all, that's all memory stuff. But one important thing that I really want to make sure that we touch on today Mm -hmm. is you talked about identifying as a procrastinator. Talk to us about that. So Typically, people come to me, they say, I'm a procrastinator. I'm an 80% person. And that is the first thing that I help them create some flexibility around because that means to me that they're looking at their behavior and they are identifying themselves with their actions. And one of the biggest forces in human personality is our identity because we're going to want to be consistent with that. So every single behavior that you're going to be looking at from the identity of a procrastinator is going to be a procrastination themed or colored, right? And that is not very helpful because it keeps you from really understanding yourself at a deeper level what are the the behaviors that actually help me regulate down and regulate up in order for me to 
get things done, right? So maybe you're very confused here working at a, your computer, but when you go out there, clean your kitchen, at a certain point, you start feeling better. But if you see yourself a, as a procrastinator, you might not stop yourself at a certain point and come back because mm -hmm. you're going to see that as a procrastination behavior and not yeah. as this is a tool for me, right? So once you start seeing procrastination is a behavior, I'm someone who procrastinates sometimes instead of I'm a procrastinator, then you can start looking at those behaviors at, and getting us data yeah. to facilitate regulating your nervous system or regulating your emotions in a way that actually helps you come back into the work that you want to be doing in a very kind way, not shame-based way, which is very coherent when you're identifying yourself with those behaviors that you deem not very good. Yeah. And when and the difference I'm hearing there is when you are a procrastinator, there is no longer anything you can do about it. Your mind is closed to any way that you can yeah. make any changes towards it because that's just who I am. But yes. when you identify your actions that what, what you said, I don't know if you said it right now, but what you said before the call is sometimes I procrastinate and I'm yeah. like, oh, well that opens up the world to if I only procrastinate sometimes, there are times that I don't procrastinate. How is yes. that true? How can I find that evidence and carry yes. that forward? And so it's just so much more open to not, I, I love talking about identity. I want to do a whole podcast about identity because it helped me so much with my anxiety. And it was yes. when I was going through certification, um, there was some coaching done where I just realized I identified as an anxious person mm -hmm. and by identifying that way, there was nothing I could do about it except take medication and mm -hmm. suffer over being anxious. <laughs> but once yeah. I realized I was just identifying that way, it took away like 50% of my anxiety in that moment. And yes. because I, and I had agency over it, but we're out of time for today. I would love to talk to Mariana all day long, but yes, we are out of time for today and I have another meeting, but I want you to tell people where can they find you? What would you like to share? Yes. First of all, thank you so much for having me, Mandy. And everybody, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to connect. And you can find me at on Instagram at Mariana underscore F Boneso. And on my bio, you find some resources, some free resources like the three step three step productivity process for high achieving procrastination, where you can um download and make it yours very good very good all right well thank you so much for being here today i appreciate it thank you for having me i appreciate you too